Hello YouTube. What I want to do in this video, and perhaps some other videos as well, is look at the role of values in science. So the traditional picture of science is that science operates according to the value-free ideal. Um, we'll define this uh, a bit more precisely shortly, but the basic idea is that science is concerned with facts, not values. Science gives us theories that tell us the facts, that describe what the world is like. Uh, it's not the job of science to tell us whether anything is good or bad, right or wrong, uh, ought to be done or ought not to be done. For instance, a psychological theory might describe various personality types, uh, including, say, psychopathy. So psychologists can describe the characteristics of psychopathy, they can describe the causes of psychopathy, you know, they can, they can sort of talk about what sorts of... Um, you know, uh, parenting behaviours might lead someone to become a psychopath later, you know, etc. right? But uh, psychology won't tell us whether or not psychopathy is morally bad, right? It won't tell us whether or not we ought to try to prevent psychopathy. Given, given that we think psychopathy is bad, then maybe we can use psychology to learn how to prevent it and treat it. Um, but similarly, like, we could use psychology to learn how to encourage people to be psychopaths, right? So, uh, the, the, so the idea of the value-free ideal is science doesn't make normative or evaluative claims. Moreover, uh, as the value-free ideal sees it, scientific theories are uh, judged according to the empirical evidence. We accept or reject theories by testing them against our observations. And when judging scientific theories, we must put aside our own moral and political commitments and we judge the theory purely on the strength of the evidence. So. You know, these sort of moral and political values do not play a role in theory assessment. So uh, that's uh, probably the common sense view of science. Um, so first of all, let's kind of make, let's make this idea a bit more precise and, um, you know, uh, make the qualifications that need to be made. Um, so first of all, it's worth distinguishing between epistemic and non-epistemic values. Epistemic values are values that indicate truth. So it's generally agreed that epistemic values are going to play a role in science. Now, different uh, philosophers and scientists will have different views about what exactly count as epistemic values, but a standard list will include things like uh, empirical adequacy. So that is, the theory correctly describes what we observe, so it, it makes the right predictions. Obviously, we want theories that make the right predictions. Um, internal consistency. Well, that's an obvious one, right? A theory should not contain contradictions. Maybe simplicity. So recall Occam's razor, do not multiply entities beyond necessity. Uh, maybe unifying power. So we favour those theories that apply to a wide range of phenomena that bring a wide range of phenomena under a few general laws. So think about how Newtonian laws can be applied to explain both the orbits of the planets and the swing of a pendulum. I mean, at first sight, those are completely different things, but Newtonian mechanics unifies these things under a single theoretical scheme. Uh, and, you know, this kind of unifying power is something that we value in our theories. So these are the sort of, these are fairly standard criteria for theory choice. Uh, scientists aim to develop theories that exhibit these features because uh, we assume these features are in some way indicative of truth. So these are the epistemic values, right? We value these features because our goal is to develop true theories and avoid false theories. Obviously then the question here is, um, not really about the role of, of epistemic values, everybody grants that, um, you know, that that's, that's fine. The, the question is about the role of the non-epistemic values, uh, moral values, political values, aesthetic values, what we might broadly call social values. For example, maybe I'm, committed to egalitarianism because I believe in the equal treatment of all people in some important sense. You know, I think it's wrong to judge people on the basis of their race or their sex. Even so, the value-free ideal will say that this moral value should not play any role in my assessment of biological theories concerning race and sex. Um, now, <clears throat> it's uncontroversial that social values, like the commitment to egalitarianism, are going to have some sort of influence on science. Uh, and in particular, I think there are, there are sort of three ways in which um, th they're going to have a, a fairly obvious influence. So first of all, social values are going to influence which questions 
we choose to explore. So we can ask, like, okay, what, what do we want to study? I mean, do we fund a new gamma ray telescope? Or should we study the mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance? Or should we build a new anthropology department, etc.? Clearly, that is a matter of social values. It's, you know, it's up to us to choose which topics we care about, and you know, that's going to depend on what we want to achieve. If we are more concerned about using science to improve human welfare, maybe we're going to give preference to studies in microbiology over studies of gamma ray astronomy. Um, obviously, you know, antimicrobial resistance, that's a really big deal at the moment. Uh, that's something that we, uh, we, we want to have uh, tools to deal, you know, to deal with that would make uh, if we could overcome antimicrobial resistance, that would improve people's lives materially. Um, gamma ray astronomy has less direct practical relevance. So that's going to be a matter of social values. Second, there are ethical constraints on how we go about gathering evidence. Um, so, for example, is it acceptable to conduct medical testing on non-human animals? Or what are the requirements of informed consent for study participants? Um, you know, that's going to impose significant constraints on how scientists can you know, go about gathering evidence for their theories. So in that sense, scientific methods are limited by social values. And then third, there's the question of what we do with scientific results, right? Like how do we apply scientific research once it has been done? Um, science can tell us how to build nuclear bombs. Should we go ahead and engineer them? Um, you know, should we should we disseminate the theories on, on which such, such technology is based to the wider public? Uh, those kinds of questions, right? This is going to be a matter for uh, social values. But there's some sense, I think, in which all of these are, you know, are, are sort of quite naturally seen as being kind of uh, external questions. So having decided upon a particular problem, having gathered evidence in a particular way, the thought is there's no reason why social values must intrude in our procedures for assessing the theory. So um, in, the, in this sense, values are not going to be involved in the scientific method, right? The, the social values are external to the scientific process, the process of judging hypotheses against the evidence. There's a famous distinction in philosophy of science between the context of discovery and the context of ju justification. So the thought is, it doesn't really matter how scientists go about inventing theories. At least it doesn't matter, you know, from the point of view of science. Uh, there's the famous case when August uh, Kekulé discovered the structure of the benzene molecule, and he said, he said that the idea first appeared to him in a dream. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, coming up with theories in dreams, well, that, that, that doesn't seem like a rational process, but it, that's fine, right? There's, there's no rules for how you come up with theories, for how you develop theories. Um, uh, that's kind of outside the, the domain of scientific methodology, right? You can come up with theories however you want. Um, similarly, we could talk about the context of application. So what we do with the results of science, right? With respect to both discovery and application, social values can play a role. But according to the value-free ideal, they should not play a role in justification, in the assessment of the strength of evidence for our theories and models, in our judgment about whether a theory or model is true. So you know, with, with Kekulé, right, okay, yeah, fine, you can, you can come up with a theory in a dream, right, but it would be absurd to say that, you know, like, it would be absurd to offer the dream as evidence for the theory. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to justifying the theory, uh, this is where scientific methodology, uh, you know, holds, right? And, and so this is where we're going to rule out social values. So with this in mind, um, we can you know, define the value-free ideal a bit more precisely. I'm slightly modifying this from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy page on scientific objectivity. Um, the value-free ideal then says that scientists should eliminate the influence of social values in the context of justification. So that is in evaluating whether or not a theory is, is true or justified. And then connected to the value-free ideal is the value neutrality thesis, which says that scientists can and sometimes do evaluate theories without using social values. The value neutrality thesis says that it's at least sometimes possible to realise the value-free ideal. Um, and you, okay, so it's, it's pretty obvious, I think, why 
the value-free ideal is appealing. Social values seem to be completely irrelevant to what the facts are. And if we were to judge theories according to our social values, it seems like that would just be wishful thinking, right? Like, I mean, just because we want something to be true, uh, just because it would be nice if something were true, that doesn't mean it is true. Um, and there have been plenty of cases where societies have used social values to judge scientific theories, and that's had disastrous results. In the Soviet Union, the government suppressed research into Darwinian natural selection and Mendelian genetics because these theories were viewed as inconsistent with the Marxist-Leninist ideology. And over decades, thousands of biologists were imprisoned or even executed for, for opposing the Soviet orthodoxy. But the result of that was Soviet agriculture suffered. Their crop yields declined. Um, you know, because actually, right, turns, it turns out that the prevailing theory, so what was known as Lysenkoism, Lysenko, Lysenkoist theory, is just wrong. Um, so, you know, uh, Richard Feynman once famously said that for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled, right? And I think that's the heart of the value-free ideal. Um, that's why you, like, you don't judge theories according to your social values, right? What you, what you want to be true um, is not necessarily what is true, right? So you have to put aside your own kind of values and biases, your moral and political commitments when you're assessing scientific theories. So that's the, the general idea. There are, however, some important challenges to uh, value neutrality and to the value-free ideal. Uh, and in this video, we'll look specifically at uh, the argument from inductive risk, which was um, most famously presented by Richard Rudner in the article, The Scientist Qua Scientist Makes Value Judgments. Okay, Rudner begins by uh, noting that scientists, in their capacity as scientists, must accept or reject hypotheses. So, like this is just that's that's a, a key part of the process of science right in in the context of justification right is accepting or rejecting hypotheses now no hypothesis is ever conclusively verified or conclusively refuted we can never prove or refute a hypothesis with complete certainty in in principle it's always possible that we might um come come across some new evidence in the future which changes our evaluation so in accepting or rejecting a hypothesis, we face inductive risk. Inductive risk is just the risk that we will be wrong when we accept or reject a hypothesis. Um, and the result of this is that scientists must decide when the, ev when the evidence for, hypo for a hypothesis is sufficiently strong. So, you know, it's like once the evidence is sufficiently strong, that's when we accept it. But when is the evidence sufficiently strong? Well, that's going to depend on the importance that we attach to making a mistake in accepting or rejecting a hypothesis. But that will involve an appeal to social and ethical values. So to see how this works, notice that with respect to any hypothesis, there are going to be four possible outcomes, right? So we might accept the hypothesis when the hypothesis is true. We might reject the hypothesis when the hypothesis is false. We might accept the hypothesis when the hypothesis is false, so we accept a false hypothesis, or we might reject the hypothesis when the hypothesis is true, so we reject a true hypothesis. So there are two types of error here. There's accepting a false hypothesis and rejecting a true hypothesis. Now, the question is, okay, you know, what, what so the question we face is like, what rules do we use for determining whether to accept a hypothesis? And that's going to depend on how we value these various possible outcomes. You know, it's, it's going to be a question of, well, which type of error do we think is more risky? You know, like what, what are the, yeah, what, what are the values of, of these outcomes? So as Rudner says, how sure we need to be before we accept a hypothesis will depend on how serious a mistake will be. So let's give an example of this. Suppose that we are um, researching a new drug for a relatively mild disease for which other successful treatments exist. And our hypothesis is that some toxic ingredient is not present in a lethal quantity. Okay, for this hypothesis, we're gonna require extremely strong evidence before accepting it because the cost of error is so high. It's, it's literally a matter of life and death. 
if we if we claim that the toxic ingredient is not at a lethal level when in fact it is it's going to cost people their lives um, and you know because the disease is mild because other treatments already exist there's not actually going to be enormous benefits from accepting the hypothesis if it's true so you know we might sort of look at the overall payoffs as kind of like this right so like, accepting the hypothesis when the hypothesis is true well you know we gain a bit of benefit from that we gain a new treatment for the disease that's that's nice um, if we reject the hypothesis when the hypothesis is false um, I mean I, I, like nothing changes nothing is lost right we're just sort of back to square one I suppose if we accept the hypothesis when the hypothesis is false so if if we accept that the the ingredient the toxic ingredient is not present in a lethal quantity when in fact it is well that's really bad um, that causes all sorts of needless deaths uh, uh, again if we if we reject the hypothesis when the hypothesis is true uh, well you know again we lose we do lose something there we lose out on a on a useful drug so when you look at this then you say yeah okay we're going to need very strong evidence before we accept this hypothesis right G given how we valued these outcomes um, now suppose, by contrast, that we are researching a new drug for rabies. Rabies is fatal once symptoms appear and no reliable treatment currently exists. Um, I mean, well, you can, if you get uh, exposed to rabies, there is a vaccine, but once symptoms appear, there's no treatment. Um, it's, it's basically a 100% mortality rate. There have been a few cases of people who've survived with an extremely complex and aggressive treatment course, but it, it's basically close to 100% mortality. So if I have a drug which can treat rabies, you know, let's say it's worked successfully in animal testing or whatever, and then, you know, I have the hypothesis that a toxic ingredient is not present in a lethal quantity to humans, well, you know, in this case, a fairly low evidential threshold will be required before implementing the drug. I mean, after all, there's nothing to lose. The only alternative for the patient is death by rabies. So, you know, we have these payoffs, right? We accept the hypothesis when the hypothesis is true. Fantastic, right? We now have, we finally have a treatment for rabies. That's, that's brilliant. We've gained enormously there. Um, if we reject the hypothesis when the hypothesis is false, well, nothing changes. We've lost nothing. If we accept the hypothesis when the hypothesis is false, so, you know, we accept that the toxic ingredient is not present in a lethal quantity, but in fact it is. We're not actually losing out much there. Um, I mean, like, okay, we give it to the patient, the patient dies. Yeah, maybe other treatments would have worked. You know, maybe we've wasted an opportunity to save this patient by using this drug, but probably not, right? <laughs> um, they're probably going to die anyway. Uh, on the other hand, if we reject the hypothesis and the hypothesis is true, again, we've lost out. We've lost out on this amazing drug. We've missed the opportunity to save many lives. So in this case, um, you know, we may accept the hypothesis with relatively weak evidence. Now, obviously, these are fairly idealized examples, but hopefully they illustrate the point. When there is a chance of error, people have a responsibility to consider the consequences of error. Um, and, you know, in two cases where the consequences of error are different, right? So like in, in one case, the error would be trivial. In another case, it would have serious negative consequences. We expect different decisions to be made. And I mean, this is true for decision making in general, right? If you go to like a hospital emergency room, well, uh, in, in that context, they're, they're pretty much always going to take symptoms of heart attack seriously, because even though there are loads of things that can produce symptoms of heart attack, and many of those things are actually not particularly dangerous, and a panic attack can cause symptoms of heart attack, the point is it's much better to incorrectly assume that a healthy person has had a heart attack than it is to turn away a heart attack victim. Right. So we we focus, we we emphasize like detecting heart attacks. And that means we're going to assume that many things that are not heart attacks are heart attacks. So this is a, a kind of common, uh, a, a common position for us to find ourselves in. And this is a problem that scientists face, just like the rest of us, when it comes to the question of whether to accept or reject a hypothesis. And of course, notice that this is a central aspect of scientific work. This occurs within the context of justification. We're asking how much evidence is required to justify a hypothesis. This depends on social values. So social values play an essential role in scientific reasoning. Um, Justin Biddle in the article, Transient Underdetermination and Values in Science, uh, gives a, a really nice statement of this argument as follows. So premise one, the scientist qua scientist accepts or rejects hypotheses 
Premise two, no hypothesis is ever completely verified. Premise three, so the decision to accept or reject a hypothesis depends on whether the evidence is sufficiently strong. Premise four, whether the evidence is sufficiently strong is a function of the importance in a typically ethical sense of making a mistake in accepting or rejecting the hypothesis. Conclusion, the scientist qua scientist makes non-epistemic value judgments. Okay, let's turn to some objections. Uh, an early response to this argument was made by uh, Richard Jeffrey um, in the article Valuation and Acceptance of Scientific Hypotheses. Uh, Jeffrey rejects the first premise, so the premise that the scientist qua scientist accepts or rejects value judgments. According to Jeffrey, scientists actually need not uh, accept or reject hypotheses. And in fact, in their capacity as scientists, that's not what they do. Instead, um, scientists assign probabilities to hypotheses given the evidence, um, or they determine the strength of the evidence for a hypothesis. So on this view, hypothesis, hypothesis acceptance is a pragmatic matter. Uh, scientists can tell you uh, you, you know, like they, they can they can tell you what the probability is, they can tell you the strength of the evidence, they can't tell you whether to accept the hypothesis. Um, so where values enter in science is how we act or what we choose to believe on the basis of these probability assessments. But the question of whether we should accept or reject hypothesis isn't really part of the context of justification. It's a practical question of how we apply science. So it's the scientist qua member of society who decides that a particular degree of probability is high enough to warrant acceptance of the hypothesis. It's not the scientist qua scientist. Um, okay, so one response to uh, Jeffrey's objection is that sooner or later scientists need to accept hypotheses in order to do further work that builds on them. Generally speaking, uh, solving one problem in science only raises further questions. And this is part of the reason why science has produced such incredibly detailed and powerful knowledge of nature. Consider, for instance, the hypothesis that sickle cell anemia is caused by an abnormality in the haemoglobin found in red blood cells. If we accept this hypothesis, then we can ask further questions. So we can ask, OK, what's the cause of that abnormality? Well, we know that it's hereditary and it occurs when people are homozygous for a mutation in the beta globin gene. And again, that raises further questions such as, you know, why has this mutation prevailed? Given that sickle cell anemia is so damaging, you'd expect there to be strong selection against it. Well, it turns out that people who are heterozygous for the mutant gene, so they, they have the sickle cell allele and the normal allele, these people are, first of all, they're able to produce normal haemoglobin, and second, they are resistant to malaria. So heterozygotes have a significant advantage um, because, you know, they have Okay, they've got like normal hemoglobin, they don't have sickle cell anemia, but moreover, they're, they're malaria resistant. That's a massive advantage in places where malaria is endemic, and that keeps the mutation prevalent in the population with the unfortunate result that some people draw the short straw and end up homozygous for the mutant allele, which causes sickle cell anemia. So, um, you know, the point is we've learned a great deal about sickle cell anemia, but we only ask those further questions once we at least provisionally accept the hypothesis that sickle cell anemia is caused by an abnormality in haemoglobin. Um, you know, there has to come a point where scientists say, okay, let's assume that this claim is true, and then let's see what else we can discover on the basis of this assumption. And of course, in practice, if you were to ask any biologist working in this field whether sickle cell anemia is caused by an abnormality in haemoglobin, they would say yes. Um, you know, this hypothesis, this isn't a question that is really open to doubt anymore, at least not in the context of scientific work here. Um, this is just one of the basic claims of the theoretical framework for studying sickle cell anemia. Uh, indeed, there's, I, I mean, I guess there's a kind of practical worry about Jeffrey's objection, which is that it ignores, perhaps ignores the kind of epistemic authority that scientists have. In like modern industrial societies, we take science to be a very powerful tool for giving us information about the way the world is. Scientists are experts. And 
in making policy decisions, we try to defer to experts. Indeed, arguably, we have no choice but to defer to experts because it's impossible for a single individual to learn all the information that is relevant to every decision they might take. So scientists are treated as experts or authorities, and as such, they have to consider how their claims will be used by, you know, by laypersons. If all of the researchers in a given field take it as an assumption that sickle cell anemia is caused by an abnormality in haemoglobin, and if they base all of their work on sickle cell anemia on this assumption, then in practical terms, that's going to be much the same as accepting the hypothesis that sickle cell anemia is caused by an abnormality in haemoglobin. That's certainly how the wider public will take it. So scientists are going to need to consider the consequences of error here. <clears throat> um, a second response to Jeffrey's objection was, in fact, already uh, anticipated by, uh, by Rudner. Um, so Rudner points out that this kind of defense of the, the value-free ideal, so this, this claim that scientists do not accept or reject hypotheses, it faces a sort of regress problem. Yeah, because let's say that uh, a scientist gives an estimate of the probability of some hypothesis. So the scientist says, you know, hypothesis H has probability P. Well, notice there's going to be some uncertainty about this estimate, right? And, and that's going to create inductive risk again. So when a scientist claims that the probability of some hypothesis, given the evidence, is such and such, what are the consequences of error concerning this probability assignment? well, you know, now we're going to have to appeal to our values to determine what judgments are acceptable. So basically, you know, so Jeffrey says, scientists merely tell us the strength of the evidence for a hypothesis. They don't tell us whether this evidence is sufficient to warrant acceptance of the hypothesis. But the problem is that to say that the strength of evidence is such and such is, Rudner says, I quote, clearly nothing more than the acceptance by the scientist of the hypothesis that the strength of the evidence is such and such. So, you know, there's not a fundamental difference between accepting a hypothesis and then accepting the hypothesis that some hypothesis has a given probability, right? So essentially all we've done is, is sort of push the problem of inductive risk back a step. Um, because actually, you know, it, like if we say, well, you know, all scientists do is they make probability assessments, those probability assessments are themselves hypotheses, right? When we say hypothesis H has probability P, that itself is a hypothesis about hypothesis H. Um, and so we still face this challenge of inductive risk. And so there is still going to be a role for values here. Um, okay, a second possible objection to uh, Rudner's argument targets premise four. Uh, recall that premise four says that whether evidence is sufficiently strong is a function of the importance in a typically ethical sense of making a mistake in accepting or rejecting the hypothesis. Is this right? So the inductive risk argument is really turning on the point that there is a gap between evidence and acceptance, that no amount of empirical evidence can ever confirm or refute a hypothesis conclusively, right? No matter how much evidence we have, right, that's not going to, like, you know, compel us with 100% certainty to, to accepting any hypothesis. So, you know, so th that means that we face this question of what counts as sufficient evidence for acceptance. And then the thought is that's where we have to appeal to social values. But the thing to notice here is that there are many scientific questions where we can't appeal to social values to determine what counts as sufficient evidence because social values are simply irrelevant to the question. So take, for instance, the hypothesis that um, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way is about 4 million solar masses. Or consider the hypothesis that the sun produces a particular flux of electron neutrinos in nuclear fusion reactions. I mean, hypotheses like these are just not directly relevant to any social concerns. Rejecting a true hypothesis or accepting a false hypothesis, that mistake isn't going to make any practical difference in these cases, except, of course, insofar as you know, the further development of science m might be hindered by any errors we make. But of course, from that point of view, both errors are equally bad. Um, so, you know, when we ask whether the evidence is sufficiently strong to justify accepting the hypothesis that the black hole at the center of the Milky Way is four million solar masses, well, we can't appeal to social values to help us. You know, it's, it's, social values are just not relevant to this. 
even so, scientists apparently do have some way of making a decision, because, I mean, they have accepted that hypothesis, uh, I, I believe. Uh, I think that astronomers pretty much universally agree on this now. Um, so that hypothesis has been accepted. It wasn't accepted on the basis of, you know, consulting social values. It, it was accepted in the absence of social values. So, so then we might think, well, you know, surely scientists are not forced to appeal to social values with respect to hypotheses that do have social significance. So whatever methods or criteria scientists use in making a judgment about hypotheses concerning black holes or neutrino flux, surely in principle we could use those same methods and criteria in other cases as well. We could apply those same methods and criteria to cases that are socially relevant. Now, obviously, the difficulty here is spelling out exactly what these methods and criteria are. Uh, you know, like, well, how, how do we, right, what, like, how do we decide what counts as sufficient evidence for the black hole hypothesis? Um, and then there's going to be the question of whether these criteria could be applied to other types of uh, cases. Um, so, you know, that's a problem. But um, the point is that we, you know, we might think that there's a sort of gap in, in Rudner's inductive risk argument here. Um, because in like the same point about inductive risk holds for cases where scientists do not appeal to social values. And perhaps that creates the space to say that, you know, we can, as an ideal, aim to eliminate social values from uh, uh, scientific reasoning. All right. Well, so far then, the argument is that values must play a role in accepting or rejecting hypotheses. But this argument from inductive risk has been extended in an interesting way by Heather Douglas in her article, Inductive Risk and Values in Science, where she argues that inductive risk is present at all stages of the scientific process, even before we face the question of whether to accept or reject a hypothesis. So actually values are going to play um, a much more significant role than even um, Rudner thought. Scientists must make um, various decisions about their research. So they have to ask, for instance, what methodological tools should we use in gathering data? How should we characterize the data? How should we interpret the data? Um, and in all of these cases, they might make errors. You know, a scientist might choose a methodology that is inappropriate. She might, she, she might suppose that there's a particular method that's reliable in that domain when actually it's not. Um, she might accept some data as sound that is not. She might interpret data on the basis of incorrect background assumptions and so on. So there's mistakes that can be made at every step here. And this means that in all these cases, there is inductive risk. So this is an important extension of the inductive risk argument because, you know, one sort of thing we might say to Rudner is, well, okay, maybe accepting or rejecting hypotheses, maybe that depends on values, but whether a piece of evidence supports a hypothesis, that doesn't depend on our value judgments, right? On, on Rudner's inductive risk argument, we can say that there's some you know, value neutral fact about what evidence we have and about the sort of rules of confirmation um, that specify what kinds of evidence confirm a hypothesis and what kinds disconfirm it. What Douglas argues is that whether, whether a given piece of evidence is available in the first place is going to um, depend on, on our value judgments and, and how the evidence is interpreted is going to depend on our value judgments. So Douglas uh, examines uh, an example concerning the characterization and interpretation of uh, the data around um, the uh, carcinogenic effects of dioxin. So toxicologists often use animal studies to test the carcinogenic effects of chemicals. And the basic questions in such studies are going to be, all right, what effect does this chemical have? And what is the dose response relationship? So the results of these studies, you know, you, you sort of dose animal groups with uh, different levels of the chemical, um, see what happens and then extrapolate the results to humans. Now, these studies play an important role in policy, policies concerning the regulation of the chemical. Douglas looks at a 1978 study by a team at Dow Chemical on the carcinogenic effects of dioxin. In the study, there were four groups of rats, three of which were exposed to different levels of the dioxin and plus a control group that had no exposure. The rats were dosed with the chemical for two years, and then their livers were autopsied to determine the prevalence of tumours. The slides of rat liver tissues were then characterised as uh, either containing malignant tumours or benign tumours 
or as being tumor three, tumor three. So this is a characterization of the data. Now, what's interesting is that in later years, these slides were re-examined by different groups of scientists who came to different conclusions about the rates of liver cancer in the rats. So they characterize the data differently. Um, here's a table which shows the results of different studies. So, um, you know, we, we have the dose level on the left, and then we have B, which stands for um, the rats with benign tumors. We have M, which stands for rats with malignant tumors. And then T is the total rats with tumors. Um, the 1978 study was by a group of toxicologists at Dow Chemical. The second evaluation from 1980 was performed by a scientist at the EPA. And the third evaluation was performed by a team at the request of the paper industry. And you can see they came to significantly different conclusions. Um, uh, now, these different evaluations, these are evaluations of exactly the same slides. It's ex exactly the same data. Um, the, the later researchers, they didn't, you know, repeat the study with different sets of rats. The question is just how should these slides with, of, of the liver samples, how are they to be classified? Um, and moreover, when you look at the details of these studies, within each evaluation, you find disagreement. So in the 1990 study, for example, pathologists disagreed about how particular abnormalities should be classified. The article states that they used majority voting. So consensus was reached when at least four out of seven pathologists agreed. Now, at this point then, we're not asking whether to accept any hypothesis about the effect of the dioxin or about the dose response relationship. The question is just, how do we characterize this data? But even at this level, we find disagreement and uncertainty. You know, even when it, even when it comes to the question of like, okay, what are we observing? Right, when we, when we look at these slides, are we observing, you know, is that a tumor or is it not? We find disagreement and uncertainty, and this entails inductive risk. So in characterizing a tissue sample as containing a cancerous lesion, lesion, there's a risk of false positives or false negatives. We might say that a healthy sample has a lesion, a lesion. We might say that a healthy sample has a lesion. We might say that a sample with a lesion is healthy. The question is, what kind of error is worse? If we focus on avoiding false positives, then we're going to say that any borderline case is not cancerous. Well, then there's a good chance that we're going to fail to catch some of the cancerous lesions. We will maximize the false negatives, in other words. So the data will make it appear that the dioxin is less carcinogenic than it actually is. That has important social implications. If the data make it appear that the dioxin is less carcinogenic, that that will probably be used to support weaker regulations. On the other hand, if we focus on avoiding false negatives, right, if we, if we sort of judge all of the borderline cases to be cancerous, the dioxin will appear more dangerous than it is. And again, that has social implications. It's, it may lead to overregulation. It's going to have economic costs, failure to develop new technologies, and so on. So in, in general, then, false negatives in this context, in this context, false negatives may lead to under-regulation, to threats to public health. False positives make the chemical appeal more dangerous. That encourages over-regulation, which has you know, economic and technological costs. Which kind of error is worse? Well, that's a matter of values. And scientists must consider these values in characterizing the liver slides. So this affects judgments at the very heart of scientific research. Um, it affects the characterization of data. In Rudner's original inductive risk argument, the point was that values are required in order to determine when the evidence is sufficiently strong to accept hypothesis. What Douglas is saying is, well, values are required in order to specify what exactly the evidence is in the first place. Now, note, the point here is, so we're not claiming that, um, that a data report is itself normative or evaluative. It isn't. So when a team of researchers say, um, for example, 5% of samples from group A contain cancerous lesions. Well, that's a straightforward descriptive statement. That's not a normative evaluative statement. But the, but the question is, well, what is it that leads scientists to accept the descriptive statement instead of some other descriptive statement, say, instead of the statement that 10% of the samples from group A contain cancerous lesions? Well, that's going to depend partly on their values. Um, so one objection to this uh, uh, argument is that actually 
we can, there are, there are methods, there are procedures for eliminating value judgments in this case. So it may be objected that, that scientists can remove the need to appeal to social values by using the right methods. For instance, when pathologists classify rat liver slides, they could use blinding methods. So suppose that some pathologist is concerned about overregulation, so is highly averse to false positives. Her, her assessments tend to result in more false negatives. Well, that doesn't really matter with respect to our conclusion about carcinogenic effect, provided that the bias is evenly distributed among all groups of slides. Um, the dosed slides will be characterized as having fewer tumors than they really do, but the effect will be the same on the control slides. The control slides will also be characterized as having fewer tumors than they really do. So the difference between the dosed slides and the control slides will be roughly the same as the actual difference. Uh, and like that means that if we're concerned about what the carcinogenic effect is, it's going to look the same. Like regard so you know regardless of you know whether whether it's a scientist who is really concerned, like who happens to be averse to judging particular. Uh, uh, abnormalities as cancerous lesions, right? I mean, in that case, right, all of the slides are going to seem to have fewer lesions, or you have a scientist who tends to over-diagnose, right? So she's going to characterize all of the slides as having more cancerous lesions than they do. The point is that in both cases, the difference is the same, and that's what's relevant to um, the question of the carcinogenic effect, is the difference between the control slides and the dosed slides. Moreover, of course, if pathologists are unaware of what slide they are assessing, they're not going to be able to judge the consequences of error uh, of their assessment of a particular slide or of their characterization of a particular slide. Um, you know, so it, like if the scientist, if a scientist is really concerned about overregulation, but then she judges that a given slide is tumor free and this slide turns out to be from the con control group, that's going to make the carcinogenic effect appear greater. So if scientists don't know what slide they're looking at, they're, they're not going to be able to use social values to influence their assessment. So, um, so this is one idea, right? Well, in this kind of case, uh, you know, really what we've identified is a problem with the methodology. What we need to do is blind the pathologists to what slides um, the, that they're looking at, to which group the slides were from. So in response to this, um, Douglas says, well, Unfortunately, such methods are not always available. In the case of the rat liver slides, Douglas points out that at higher dose levels, other signs of liver toxicity become apparent in the slides. So the higher dose levels will be identifiable by the pathologists through these other signs of liver toxicity. In which case, it's impossible to blind the pathologists um, to you know, which group the slide was from. Uh, still, you know, perhaps the defender of uh, the value-free ideal can push back a little bit on this point. So, like, okay, granted, complete blinding is not always possible, but what if it were? Then it seems like it would be a good idea to use it. It would be good practice to use it. Why would that be a good idea? Well, precisely because it would remove the bias of individual scientists. I mean, perhaps in practice we have no choice in some contexts to appeal to values in characterizing data. When scientists are aware of the consequences of error, they're going to use social values to guide their judgments. But we might see this as an imperfection in our application of scientific methodology. Uh, the value-free ideal is, after all, only an ideal. It, you know, it tells us, like, as an ideal, eliminate the influence of social values in the context of justification. But that's not always going to be possible. Um, and th but that's not really a an objection to the value-free ideal. That's just to say, you know, we don't always achieve our ideals, uh, and that that is the case for um, for pretty much all of our ideals, right? Like we often fail to achieve them. Um, so it's not obvious that uh, this point is yeah. So it's not obvious that that, that Douglas's response here um, really connects with this point. Uh, uh, it's it seems like it would be a good idea to use blinding if it were possible. It's not always possible. Um, but is that a challenge to the value-free ideal? That's not obvious. Okay, well, you know, that's, uh, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, so thank you for watching. Um, I will see you in the next video.